Hello, everyone, as you come into the room, thanks for making the time to join us this evening. My name is Michael. I'm the events coordinator and publicist at Annie Bloom's Books. For those of you who aren't familiar with the store, admitting someone else, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the store, we're located in Southwest Portland, Oregon, in the heart of Multnomah Village, where we've been around now for 44 years. Oh, good, more people are coming, welcome. Uh, Annie Bloom's is open on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and on weekends from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Our website is always open. You can shop day and night at anniebloom's.com. We offer in-store pickup, local delivery, and USPS shipping. I'm gonna put the address for this event here in the chat. So you can hop over there right now and buy both authors' books tonight. We're welcoming Portland author Rachel King for the online launch of her new linked short story collection, Bratwurst Haven. Rachel is going to be in conversation with Rajia Hasib, author of the novel A Pure Heart. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end. You can feel free to type questions into the chat and I'll read them later. Or you can also click on the little blue hand icon once we get to the Q&A that's uh, in the reactions menu down there, if you feel like asking a question live. Let me tell you about Rachel's Bratwurst Haven. Link stories trace the vocational and emotional bargains made by workers at a Colorado sausage factory. Let me admit someone here. Colorado Sausage Factory is almost a decade after the Great Recession and in Colorado, St. Anthony Sausage has not recovered. Neither have its employees, a laid off railway engineer, an exiled computer whiz, a young woman estranged from her infant daughter, an older man with cancer who lacks health care. As these low-wage workers interact under the supervision of the factory's owner and his quietly rebellious daughter, they come to understand that in America's post-industrial landscape, although they may help or comfort each other, they ha also have to do what's best for themselves. Over the course of these 12 interrelated stories, Rachel King gives life to diverse, complex, and authentic characters who are linked through the sausage factory and through their daily lives in a vividly rendered small town in Boulder County. The internal and external struggles of Bratwurst Haven's population are immediately and intimately relatable and resonant. These people seek answers within the world they inhabit while questioning what it means to want more from their lives. It really is a great collection. I loved it myself. Rachel King is the author of the novel People Along the Sand. Her short stories have appeared in One Story, Wow, North American Review, Green Mountains Review, Northwest Review, and elsewhere. A graduate of the University of Oregon and West Virginia University, she lives in her hometown here of Portland, Oregon. Let me tell you about Rajya's uh, Pure Heart, a powerful novel about two Egyptian sisters, their divergent fates, and the secrets of one family. Rich in depth and feeling, A Pure Heart is a brilliant portrait of two Muslim women in the 21st century and the decisions they make in work and love that determine their destinies. As Rose is struggling to reconcile her identities as an Egyptian and as a new American, she investigates Gamila's devotion to her religion and her country. The more Rose uncovers about her sister's life, the more she must reconcile their two fates, their inextricable bond as sisters, and who should and who should not be held responsible for Gamila's death. A Pure Heart is a stirring and deeply textured novel that asks what it means to forgive and considers how faith, family, and love can unite and divide us. Rajia Hasi was born and raised in Egypt and moved to the United States when she was 23. Her first novel, In the Language of Miracles, was a New York Times editor's choice and received an honorable mention from the Arab American Book Awards. She holds an MA in creative writing from Marshall University, where she's now teaching, and she has written for the New York Times Book Review and the New Yorker Online. She lives in West Virginia with her husband and two children. Welcome, everyone, Rachel and Rajia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here celebrating uh, with Rachel the release of her beautiful collection of interconnected short stories. And um, I look forward to hearing her read from it. Rachel, do you want to start with the, with a reading? Sure. Well, yeah. Thank um, you, Michael, for the introductions too. And I was telling Michael, I know Regia because she was one of my peer reviewers at West Virginia University Press. They have to have two outside people approve of the book. Um, and then the board has to accept it. Um, and she um, approved of my collection with reservations with, the, she wanted me to do uh, some revision. And I'm really glad that she did, she requested that uh, because the story I'm gonna read you tonight wouldn't exist without that. And it's a 
much better collection because of her work on it. So I invited her here to discuss it with me. So thank you for coming and for all your work on my collection. Okay. So thank the, you so the, much for, the for inviting me and for being so gracious regarding my, <laughs> my criticism. I I wouldn't have um, suggested revisions if I hadn't loved it so much. Okay. Right? <laughs> um, all right. So the story I'm going to read tonight. Um, it was really hard for me to decide what story I'm going to read and I'm going to do several events and I think I'm just going to read a different story at each one because I, I like a lot of them. Um, I thought the one I would read tonight, uh, I, it's called Murals and it's about an artist and I thought it was fitting because I am an artist. I've been trying to be an artist for a while and I've, I think I've written dozens of short stories. Obviously some of them are bad, only some of them are published, but I think this is the only one I've written about an artist. So I thought I'd start with this one. <laughs> All right, so murals. Cynthia finished the mural in downtown Boulder the day before Easter, one she'd been commissioned to do soon after Lance had left town. She still had reservations about painting it, a mural that depicted different races with clasped hands side by side in a town where many brown people lived in small apartments she'd grown up in and many white people in nicer apartments or houses. But she enjoyed painting and the building's owner was paying her $20 per square foot. At least she wouldn't have to see it every day. She'd moved to the more Latino La Forge seven years ago after her mom died. And these days she went through Boulder only to go on a hike with her older brother, Eddie, or to visit him at his condo in Nederland, one of the towns toward the mountains. Both of them were working during the day on Easter. She has a bartender, he has an EMT, but they plan to meet up in the evening. At home, a 500 square foot one bedroom apartment on the second story of an old white stucco house divided into four units. She took a bath. The muscles in her shoulders, arms, and back had been strained from painting the mural more than she thought they would be since she painted canvases regularly in her apartment and had even muraled most of her bedroom. She'd lived there five years and the landlord who rarely entered her unit never entered her bedroom. So a couple years ago, she'd pencil sketched along the white walls then eventually painted three out of four of them. The apartment complex she'd grown up in, her mom, her brother, some friends, her high school soccer fields, the coffee shop where she'd worked from ages 18 to 22, the LaForge bungalow she'd rented with a few friends, this stucco house, the long counter at the bar in St. Anthony where she worked now, guys sitting on stools, their backs to the viewer. She thought maybe she'd paint Lance facing out but was now glad she hadn't. She'd whitewash the mural before she moved out but that would be a while. She didn't know where else she'd find a pet friendly place with cheap rent and such an inattentive landlord. She was curled up on her navy blue couch watching episodes of It's Always Sunny and petting her large black dog Meadow when Lance texted. Great sunset today was all he said with a photo of a deep orange ball of sun lowering behind a flat snowy landscape. Very pretty, she texted back, then sent him a photo of the boulder mural. Finished today, she wrote. Very nice, he texted, but I still like the one in your bedroom better. She wasn't sure whether this comment was sincere or hinted toward their intimacy, probably both. She liked the one in her be bedroom better too. But the instructions said to paint people of different races holding hands. She decided the figures would hold their hands above their heads. This choice improved it, but she still thought it would look better on the side of an elementary school, not the side of a business. All the Easter regulars were there the next day, except for an older guy, Joey, who died last summer. Lance and his former coworkers from the factory had worked closely with Joey. Some had more fondness for him than others, but all of them openly mourned him for weeks afterward. They'd sit at the large round table or play darts while telling stories of how he stood up to their boss or how he'd drink food out of a straw because he didn't have teeth or how he'd refuse cancer treatment. She herself remembered him as a gruff man who visited Fred's only on Easter and would tell her which buildings used to house which businesses in Old Town St. Anne if asked. Today, the regulars left his stool empty. She placed his drink, a martini, on the bar counter as a memorial, then went about her business. By lunchtime, Billy wanted to talk about Easter. It's the most important holiday for Christians, he said. Don't know what the fuss about Christmas is all about. His bushy gray eyebrows had a mind of their own. Cynthia agreed while she got him another rum and coke. Everyone is born, Billy said. That didn't prove his deity. He proved his deity by coming back to life. Again, she agreed. She listened to him proclaim Christ's deity every Easter like some bar priest. As she washed glasses, she scrunched her face at the thought of Eddie's fiance, Isabel, who's probably at an Easter mass right now and would probably accompany Eddie later. Cynthia found Isabel boring. She had her mother's nurturing nature and obsession with religion without her grit or capacity for delight. Isabel was always talking about wanting babies and the meals she cooked, traditional gender roles that sounded constricting to Cynthia, 
which was probably why she gravitated toward middle-aged men who led peripatetic lives like Lance, who is 38 and a train engineer. She'd also been involved with, among others, a guy who frequented Hong Kong on business trips and a guy whose immediate family lived in the Czech Republic. You go to church today, Billy, Cynthia asked as she heard him telling Jasmine, another Easter regular, about the woman who found Jesus' tomb empty. Billy straightened. I know everything taught there. What's the point? You need to hear it here. Cynthia exchanged looks with Jasmine and they both laughed. What's so funny, Billy asked. I've been hearing that story my whole life, Jasmine said. Cynthia too, I think. You'd be surprised who doesn't know it, Billy said. And there's a difference between knowing and understanding, he added. You're right, Cynthia said. You never know who knows and doesn't know, Billy. His face relaxed into a smile. Then he took his drink to the foosball table. How are you doing, Jasmine asked Cynthia. I'm good. Cynthia poured Jasmine a glass of Chardonnay. How about you? Happy to be here. By the time I return from my walk, my girl should be glazing the ham. Jasmine was one of the few who didn't come to the bar on Easter because she lived alone, but because she wanted to break from her family. You doing anything after work? Meeting my brother at Rodrigo's. The mural ha Cynthia had finished was on the building across from the restaurant. And although she was ambivalent about the content, she was sure about the quality and wanted Eddie to see it. Jasmine nodded toward the martini. For Joey? Yes. Heard, but not till after the funeral. The sausage boys keep me informed. You still going with that one, Lance, not really. Jasmine looked past Cynthia, not really. I know how that is. Cynthia wondered why she hadn't said no, then thought probably because she wasn't involved with anyone else yet. She was getting older and was not as nimble or proactive in picking up guys. She smiled to herself at this half true thought while cutting lemons and limes. Jasmine wanted to hug Cynthia before she left and Cynthia let her because she liked her, though she didn't usually hug customers. A regular couple arrived and Cynthia played a game of darts with them. She was better at pool than darts, but had improved her game lately since a new bartender liked to play as she was leaving when he was taking over. Billy became drunker as the afternoon progressed, but not violently so. He crooned Easter hymns to himself at the round table in between proselytizing and foosball. A few minutes before six, when her shift would end, Cynthia turned to see Lance sitting next to Joey's old seat, his large shoulders hunched, his face a full smile. She took a step back. His presence was so different than the thought of him. Joey's drink, he nodded at the martini. It's a memorial, been there all day, probably got my spit in it. She grabbed the glass, turned and tossed the liquid in the sink. Hello to you too, he said. She turned back and smiled. Hello, you surprised me, that was your plan? He nodded, his smile had faded, his eyes were earnest. She leaned over to touch the indent in his chin then went to get him a whiskey neat. Just a single, please, he said. She poured it then set it in front of him, drinking less. I don't have to cope from working at that place. It's nice to be on the road again. He sipped the whiskey, though nothing beats our trip to Grand Junction. In December, they'd gone on a train trip through the Rockies to celebrate him landing his job. In a canyon, trestles held up tracks 100 feet off the ground. Cynthia loved looking down into the depths, then up at the peaks. She turned to Toby, her replacement, who was asking a question about food prep. She answered, then introduced him to Lance. Lance was a regular here for a couple years, she said. Nice to meet you, man, Toby said. You have time for a game, he asked Cynthia. A quick one, she said. I'm meeting my brother for dinner. Lance's shoulders slouched more. We already had plans, Cynthia said. Maybe we could meet up later, he asked. I don't know how long I'll be out. I'll keep you posted. He nodded. You want to play darts, she asked. He finished his whiskey and stood. She learned over the game that he'd already seen his ex and middle school aged daughter. Save the best for last, she said. Always, he said. You're better at darts now. Things change, she said. He could have looked her up on his earlier leaves that winter, but didn't, which Cynthia didn't mind. She wouldn't have been ready to see him then, but she was ready now. He leaned his whole long upper body too far forward as he shot, not good form, but endearing. After the game, they kissed lightly outside the bar before Cynthia rode the bus home to walk Meadow. On the ride, she smiled at Lance's childlike delight at Joey's drink at the darts. When relaxed, he was good company. She was glad he hadn't lost interest in her. As Cynthia leashed up Meadow, she told her she had to leave again soon, but that they'd spend the whole next day together. They walked by refurbished mining shacks, Cynthia's regular laundromat, the local theater. On Main Street, a regular cashier nodded to Cynthia from inside a Latino grocery store and Cynthia nodded back. She thought of Eddie, of how he wanted her to leave the service industry. Because she loved and respected him, because he was her closest family, living family member, she always listened to his advice, though she knew his wants and desires would never align with hers. Once, about a year ago, during their first conversation on the topic where she'd resolved not to argue, he even suggested that she might have been more traditionally ambitious if, like him, she'd remembered emigrating from Guadalajara. He'd only been three and their mom pregnant with her, so she doubted he remembered it as much as he claimed. 
I like that my job gives me the headspace to paint in my off hours, was all she said. You could still paint while having a better job, he'd said. You can't live like this forever. Her watercolor landscapes being featured in Art Walk last summer and her being commissioned to do the mural this winter had given her more confidence that she could in fact live like this forever. And maybe Lance would be a good long-term match for her, she thought as Meadow gulped from the water bowl outside an ice cream shop. Cynthia liked his body, his optimism, his hardworking nature, and his desire to be on the road also attracted her. And he was on the road a lot now. So even if they became an official couple, she'd have weeks at a time to be by herself in paint. As she walked by a flea market and back into the neighborhood, she pulled out her phone. I want to see you later, she wrote. If you want to go over early and let Meadow out, she'd like that. She's had a long day, she added in a second text. Great, he replied. I'll head over in about an hour, watching a game with Aaron. Cynthia took a quick shower, then set Meadow up on the couch with a rawhide chew and told her Lance would be over to play with her. Meadow banged her tail as though she understood. She liked it when Lance came over. Eddie and Isabel were on the open air roof deck of the restaurant, sitting at a table with their backs to the mural, mural jars of margaritas in front of them. Cynthia sat across from them, facing her painting. They exchanged greetings and anecdotes about their days. Isabel had been to mass with her extended family as Cynthia had expected, and Eddie, like Cynthia, had had a quiet shift. People don't get as suicidal at Easter as at Christmas, he said. After they ordered food, Cynthia mentioned the mural, pointing behind Eddie and Isabel so they'd turn their heads. Another group who'd just arrived blocked the view. We might need to stand, she said. They all walked to the railing. Whoa, Eddie said, it's the largest painting you've done, right? He'd seen her bedroom mural and a few of her acrylic oil and watercolor paintings, but he'd been working during the walk that had working during the art that had during the walk that had featured her art. Yes, I love it, Isabel said. Cynthia liked the simplicity of the painting even less. I like what you have, Eddie said, but are you done? The empty area behind it. I thought I was done, yes, Cynthia said. The empty space bothered Cynthia as she ate. Maybe it's not done, she said. What? Eddie asked. He'd been snatching beans off Isabel's plate while she slapped his arm lovingly. The mural, she said. I do like the busyness of the one in your bedroom better, Eddie said. That's what Lance said. Eddie became solemn. You still talking to that guy? Off and on. He's on the road for his railway job mostly. You be careful. He said that about every white guy she was interested in. She changed the conversation to Eddie and Isabel's upcoming September wedding, a topic she knew Isabel would latch on to. They decided to have a ceremony at her church, Isabel said, then a reception in the mountains. You could add mountains to the background, Eddie said, and glanced over his shoulder. You're good at painting those. The customers who had blocked the view of the mural were gone. Cynthia could see the raised arms and clasped hands, but not the faces. I like how it is, Isabel said, friendly, clear. Mountains, okay, maybe, Cynthia said, maybe apartments too, like the ones we grew up in and some boulder houses. Isabel jutted out a bottom lip. That sounds good, Eddie said. You could add churches too, Isabel said, one Catholic, one Protestant. I like that idea, Cynthia said, surprising herself. I'll start right after this. After, after Isabel took off to her sister's place, Cynthia showed Eddie the closet where she'd stored the lights, ladder, smock, paint, and brushes. She set up the floodlights across the alley facing the side of the building. It was dark outside the lights beams, but she preferred to work at night with fewer people gawking or just around. She was thankful Lance was with Meadow so she didn't feel rushed to get home. She was also happy to be alone with her brother. Do you ever get scared being alone out late at night? He asked. No. She waited for him to tell her to be careful, but he didn't. After she sketched some apartments in her notebook, he handed her the color she asked for so she wouldn't have to get off the ladder. It was a much faster way to work than alone. You could be my assistant, she joked. I think my job pays a bit more per hour. He stayed until she'd finished painting the apartments and had sketched a brick church. It's getting there, he said, looking over her shoulder. I'm glad you approve. She smiled, almost hiking season. It was something Isabel hated, hiking. I want to show you this lake I found in October. Okay, maybe I'll bring Miguel. He was always trying to set her up with some nice Mexican guy, since high school, in fact. Okay, she said. You don't give a fuck about him, do you? No, I don't. They both laughed. She gave him a goodbye hug, then checked her phone. Just a photo of Meadow asleep half on top of Lance on the couch. Who needs me when Meadow is there, she texted back. Any ETA, he asked. She looked at the mural. Lots to do, but the bus only ran till midnight. 12, she replied. We'll be here napping, he wrote. She sketched a racially ambiguous Jesus onto the door of the church and thought Billy and probably Jasmine too would be pleased. She sketched a Victorian, a large modern style boulder house and behind them Aspens and mountain peaks. She started to paint, but it took longer to bring the equipment up the ladder without an assistant and the evening was getting on, so she quit. The building's owner had requested it finished by June 1st, so she had some time 
and it also felt good to know there was more painting to be done. It gave her something to look forward to. While she waited for a, bu the bu a bus, a feeling of pleasure rose in her muscles. In anticipation of sex, yes, but also pleasure in the soreness from work had, where the work had entered her body. Unlike yesterday, the pain was not acute, but more of a memory, muted. It was growing chillier outside, but she brought her jean jacket for that. After she put it on, she checked her phone. The canyon our train went over might look good on your empty bedroom wall, Lance had written. What do you think? She envisioned the painting from sky and peaks to train and trestles to the Colorado River. It would be a nice contrast to the more everyday scenes on the other walls. I love that idea, she thought and texted. So that was the end of that story. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much you. for sharing this. Uh, I, I was like really excited when I got to this uh, story, partly because, I mean, I love Cynthia as a character in general. Uh, I love her job at the bar. I love how she interacts with everyone at it. And I love the fact that she's an artist on top of it, yeah. you know, and she yeah. paints murals and all your descriptions of, of her work um, are beautiful and very okay. visual. And I, I just loved all of that. But I loved seeing Lance again because Lance was in the, his point of view was in the very first story. So that's what you yeah. start the collection with. Yeah. And I had, I was rereading this uh, the other day and, um, and I just, I remembered you have, you write such beautiful prose. And um, at the very beginning, I have to just point out one line because when we meet Lance in the beginning, he talks about how, you know, he lost his job as a railroad engineer and he's working at this sausage factory where all the stories kind of, that connects all the stories. And he, we have like two paragraphs of, about a page of describing what he's doing in the factory. And he talks about how it's always cold at the factory because of the meat. And then we get one line on the second page of the collection, but the temperature kept me alert and the hard work sometimes distracted me from thinking about the man I'd killed. <laughs> and then you're like, whoa. <laughs> and you have so much of this beautiful, beautiful, just surprising uh, prose and the turns and the way to just kind of connect um, the reader and to make it this really like be a page turner. I, I really enjoyed reading it. And oh, uh, I mentioned all of this because this the way this is working is because it is a collection of interconnected short stories. You get these characters that have their own points of view and then they show up again as secondary characters and other character stories. And I think it's it's it, it's a very it makes for a very interesting read when it's done as well as you do it. So I was just wondering uh, how that came to be. Like, well, how did you decide to write a collection of interconnected short stories? Did it start with a specific one or did you start with the sausage factory, the St. Yeah. Anthony's sausage? Which again, <laughs> is, a, is an amazing setting, a sausage factory, we'll get to that. But how, how did this start? Like, why, why did you um, just decide that this would be the best way to tell these stories? Um. Well, I'm so glad you enjoyed it and I really appreciate your enthusiasm. And um, yeah, I just appreciate you engaging with them so much. Um, so the first story that I wrote was Railing, which is the first story in the collection. And um, my boyfriend, now husband, he worked at a sausage factory for about two and a half years. And so I never went inside of it, but um, he would tell me about it, obviously. And so that is where the setting came from. And there was a guy there who had been a railway engineer or conductor and um uh he had run over someone and i met him one time um and so that that's where the fir very first story came from it was several years later or a few years later when i started it in 2016 um and then after that i didn't know when i wrote that first story i just wanted to explore that one concept and um then i wrote the story about aaron um, who is trying to decide whether he wants to be a father. Um, and that story, I, I thought of him working at the sausage factory, but I mainly, it was the concept of the story again. Um, and then I wrote a couple others. And then I started writing ones where they hadn't been in railing, but I kind of put them into railing, like <laughs> retrospectively, mm -hmm. um, just to explore these characters that I wanted to explore. Um, so, it was very slow process. I mean, it started in 2016 and finished in like 2021 or 2020. So um, it was just very slow. And every time I wrote a new story, I was like, well, here's a story, like maybe I can send it out. But I didn't really admit that I was 
writing a collection until I was done because it's too much pressure. <laughs> so I was like, I'm just going to write another story. <laughs> and then, um, then once I had a collection, I, I enough for a collection, I put them together and saw how they might work. And um, I had friends who helped me with it and, and you and WB Press helped me connect them. So, yeah. Well, it's, it, it's, I want to say that's not slow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that many, because the short stories are really each its own unique, like independent worlds. Yeah. But then they're still connected to the, to others. Yeah. So just in terms of um, coming up with so much material, that's a lot yeah. to come up with. You could have yeah. <laughs> any one of those into its own novel novel yeah <laughs> even less work than having to come up with so many different <laughs> plot lines you know for so many different stories. yeah so, <laughs> i think it's wonderful and and, and it's and, and i wanted to ask um <laughs> about the research and the sausage factory so yeah more like yeah you, you must have had insider knowledge yeah exactly yeah research i definitely because, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I definitely had insider knowledge um, about that. And like I said, it was all just like hearsay because I never went inside. Um, but I definitely like felt like I knew it after he described it for so long. Um, I also was going to say about like the research aspect of it. Um, it reminds me a little bit of like when I do historical research and I learn like a lot about it. And I, and I think you probably do stuff like this, but um, knowing your writing, but I learned so much about it and then I kind of just like filter it out and just like include tiny details and so that's how I felt about about the factory where I just like a few details here and there that I yeah but they were they were perfect details because <laughs> it's it's really like that's one thing that struck me the balance between just having enough technical detail to make readers believe that you must have worked at a factory, yeah. <laughs> factory before or you know and yeah. and and still managing to do so without overwhelming readers with technical details which happens a lot when you read something and you feel that the the writer did so much research and now they just have so much information that they want to give you yeah but you balance this beautifully and Thank you. You know, i couldn't have like I, I couldn't tell that you've never actually been inside a factory yeah. <laughs> That's a, you did an excellent job with this Thanks. so so my next question is about colorado like why why set the collection and it's it's in saint anthony's which is a fictional yeah. town in colorado, yeah fictional as you to me and yeah. so so why set it there and you know I, I understand the fictional aspect of it because i set my first novel in a fictional town yeah. but but why in colorado and and yeah. why fictional from your point of view why not actually yeah. you know, in a real town um yeah great question so i um i lived in colorado from 2012 to 16 and um i had lived in baltimore west virginia uh, baltimore morgantown West Virginia and one summer in Maine and I had been back east for five and a half years when I moved to Colorado um, but I am from Oregon originally um, so I had experienced like the east coast and all three of those places are very different have very different cultures on the east coast but when I moved back to Colorado in, or back west to Colorado in 2012 I kind of felt like I was coming back to like a western U.S. culture and it was really fascinating to me um, even though the geography there is very different from Oregon, I, I just, I felt like in some ways, like culturally, I was coming back home and, um, that when I started writing these stories, it was right when I moved back to Oregon and I, I was just kind of, I felt like that area captured my imagination because, the culture was so close to what I'd grown up in and so different from the East. And I, I didn't really understand why. And so I think that was one reason I started writing stories about the area. And I wrote one story when I was there that's not related to this collection where I was like explicitly trying to understand like the, the different culture between the West and the East. But then this one, it's more subtle. It's just, I'm exploring characters who live there. So, um, but yeah, I, I lived and, and then the fictional aspect when I started, I lived in Lafayette and Louisville, and I started it set in those towns and a couple others. Um, and then when I was revising, I was just like, I don't know if the library is the same distance from <laughs> Main Street as I have it, or like where the lake is in relation to this. And I realized I was kind of like creating my own town, um, and I didn't want it to not be accurate. Also, I was writing it set in 2016 on and I'd lived there before 2016 so things might have changed um so I just decided to uh make the town fictional and then 
keep it within Boulder County and Colorado for that. Um, yeah, for the Western sense of it. So yeah, I, I love that, and I agree. It gets tricky when you try when you start to imagine a place, and then you, it's not and your imagination is makes it a little bit different from what the place yeah. you actually remember. <laughs> And yeah, I had the same problem with my first novel. And then I was like, yeah. I'll make it my own town because exactly. this is not close to the train station. Exactly. <laughs> I live there. So, so I, understand, I understand that, but it works. I think it works. I think it's very good. Yeah. Um, okay, so other than, than location, the stories are um, connected by characters and by themes. And, mm -hmm. and you have these just rich, amazing collection of themes from relationships and families and motherhood and just generally this this sense that I got in all stories that these characters are like at the cusp of change something is about to change for every one of them and it's 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 beautiful writing but it's and it's very interesting and engaging writing uh, so um I would just I was wondering how you view these themes what um, do you think are the main themes that connect these stories what do you want readers to kind of get out of reading these interconnected stories. Yeah, um, I really like that you noticed the the theme of like shift and change and that kind of thing. And um, I like that you put that in your blurb. Mm. And um, I, I was writing something for a website, Necessary Fiction last week, they asked me to write something about the collection. And I was thinking about that that feeling of change and shift and I was thinking about how when I started the collection when I was 32 um like the first like 14 years of my adult life I'd lived in like uh 14 different places and um I'd had like over 15 jobs and so like I think I think a lot of that kind of reflected in in the stories um so I think that's where it came from although I hadn't thought about that before really before last week <laughs> but um I, I remember when you had your critique of my collection you mentioned that readers got different themes from it like things you wouldn't ever notice and I really liked that because I feel like that too and I'm excited to hear the themes that other people um bring out uh, after reading it um but as far as what I would say when I've been trying to like promote it I would say I was trying to explore like what being a Westerner is, if it means anything. That was one of them that I kind of already discussed. Um, also, like why do young people leave home? Because there's several characters in their 20s who have left home. Um, so that was something that I was trying to explore. Um, and then the last one I would say was probably just like how people at lower wage jobs like support each other or like just like kindness and transition um that was a big one that I, I think I was exploring or retroactively exploring you know you make these characters and then you kind of find the themes in between them but I think that was a, a big one um uh whether it was like <clears throat> in the first story like Aaron giving away his frozen sausage to Lance or like Elena's landlords inviting her to dinner Kathleen inviting Matt and his kid and girlfriend to Thanksgiving, um, you know, Pavel's neighbor was kind of adopting him, just like these like uh, kindness kind of outside of the family, the, these people that are in transition experience. And I think that was a, a big one for me for, in that themes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a sense of community that you portray so well between, between those people who are very diverse and different, but who are genuinely kind yeah. uh, mostly and kind to each other and 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 I, I agree you know something one of the beautiful things is I know you I, like I always believe you don't want to superimpose your own themes on readers because <laughs> readers are so perceptive that they will surprise you mm -hmm. and find things in your work that you hadn't even in, kind of noticed was there yeah. uh, were there and it's always a pleasure when a reader goes oh I like this because of that and then you go oh I did this I didn't even realize I did right. <laughs> So it's always a very nice uh, surprise, but I also wanted to give you a chance to to share what you had in mind because it's yeah. also very um, gratifying if someone kind of picks on what you were thinking uh, of. And right. I want to like, give readers a hint, like read for this and read for that, and you'll find this, and and that's also right. a, a nice experience. So, um, I have a lot of story uh, questions, so I hope we have a lot, <laughs> enough time for all of that. But um, my uh, my next question. Um, Bradford's Haven, and yeah. then there's Bradford's Heaven, and I don't want to spoil it, but uh, 
why did you uh, come up like why why this title can you tell us anything about the title because i love it yeah i, I, love yeah, it. I don't want to spoil it either but i can yeah. tell you like in the last story one of the characters i guess she's she's working on a sign she's trying to start a business and she wants her business to be called bratwurst heaven and they mess up the sign and it's called bratwurst haven so she has to get the sign redone um and that i wrote that story it, i think it was like the fourth story i read in the collection and um, I didn't have the title from the beginning and I, I grabbed it out, you know, like after I read the story, I thought this, this story is called, it should be called Browish Taven. And I think for me, um, that story and the collection in general, it speaks to kind of the factory or like work in general being like a, a safe kind of space where the characters can come to and um, in some place they can hide in both like good and bad ways. Um, so in a nutshell, I think that's like why I decided to name the collection that as well. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that I think that's that's very ins insightful in general to think of their workplace as a haven, even though it's really like none of them love the job. <laughs> yeah, <you know>? no. <laughs> yeah no, they don't really like it there. Yeah. <laughs> It's not that they, they don't have the nicest boss and they, yeah. <laughs> you know, they, 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 have, they struggle with many things, but it is in a way a place where they come together and where they connect and where they have formed these relationships that helped so many of them and that, you know, where they supported each other. So it's, I think it's a beautiful title. I think oh, I have you. so much trouble with titles all the time. So I'm always in awe when I find a title that I like, and then I read the collection. I'm like, oh, that was perfect. That, that was a, a stroke of genius coming up with this. Oh, thank you. So uh, I, I love that. Um, well, going going back to the cast of characters and yeah. to, you mentioned that they're different, right? They are mm -hmm. different and diverse characters and they still connect. Um, but from a writer's point of view, um, I, I really um, am interested in, in how the choice to make these characters so diverse kind of started or came to you because we have um, like characters who are on a broad spectrum of racial, ethnic, sexual orientation, diversity. It's it, like it, everything. You have a Russian gay, a, a gay Russian immigrant in there who's, yeah. who has like the, one of the most, like, they're all fascinating, but his story <laughs> is like, is I, I love it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, how, how did this come to be? Is this an intentional choice that you made or is this something that kind of organically developed as you were writing these stories? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm I'm so glad you like them. And Pavel, I think, might be one of my favorite characters or favorite stories too. So, I really like him. And and um, he's the gay Russian immigrant. And I can talk a little bit about that one. Um, to to show my process, like, so like when the character comes to me, it just like comes to me as like a person formed, and then I write the story. But then like after I write the story, I can see kind of where the influences came from if that makes sense so mm -hmm. like with him I actually like I lived in an apartment complex where there was a drug dealer and I used to talk to him sometimes when I would like come home and leave and stuff and it was in Colorado and one time I was like oh my gosh it's just so cold we were talking about the weather and he was like yeah you know but like I'm from Russia and I was like oh okay <laughs> And um, I studied Russian actually um, in college and I lived there for a year. And um, so I was like, okay. And I, I did put him in a poem at that time, but that was like 2013 or, and I wrote the story in like 2020. Um, but also uh, my husband knew someone who I met a couple times who was uh, like a prize winning high school teacher in Pennsylvania. And then the cops found a bong in his search history and he was fired from his job and he became a drug dealer in West Virginia. Um, the good the good, good thing about that story is he's now back teaching high school. Um, he's now back teaching high school science. So that, that happened. So that was like two aspects of this character um, kind of. And then um, I think he just came to me as like being gay and that he would take someone home like one of his customers and I knew it was a man and it would kind of you know mess up his life a little bit um and I think I noticed afterwards I have like two main characters who are gay in the collection and both of them are kind of from um either like small towns or backgrounds that uh where they have to keep who they are under wraps a little bit and I think that that's just my 
experience with my closest friends who are gay. A couple of them are women who didn't come out till like their late twenties. And one of them, um, even though he's married, he is still not out to his family. Um, so it's just, you know, all of these things are like influencing me subtly. And then I'm writing the character out of that. So that's like kind of how it comes from. Um, I think also like there's uh, diverse people who've married into my family. So it's just kind of like around me. Um, and, and also that kind of job, like when my husband worked at a the factory, there were diverse characters there, or like when I worked in the food service industry. Um, so it's just kind of like a realistic thing too, you know, um, to have the, the diverse characters. So, yeah. Well, I, I I love your description of how that character came to be because yeah. a lot of times, uh, like I'm asked, and I'm sure you're asked the same, like, oh, are these characters based on real people? Are there, yeah. this, this is like a common question. Yeah. And it's kind of difficult to explain how it's yes and no, right? Yeah. yeah. This, no, this is not, and, you know, Muriel or something, it's not yeah. her, but it's <laughs> maybe just like the way she kind of like tilts her head when she talks, combined exactly. with the way this other person likes to smoke and combined yeah. with the way that this third person like says this specific right. thing. And the way you're describing how it's, he's he's a, a little bit of this story that you heard and a little bit of this guy that yeah. you met, it's perfect. It's a perfect yeah. description of, of how fictional characters kind of sometimes they have developed um, yeah. out of our, our experiences in general, but they are a collage. They're not like, they're never like a, an actual kind of you know copy and paste right, but <laughs> right. Bit of, so, the, so the, I love that just in terms of, of writing I love hearing that mm -hmm. so uh well okay so we're, since we're talking process can you yeah. talk a little bit about revision how how does your revision process look like uh like are you like do you revise non non-stop yeah. to, to forever or do you like hate it and how, how do you approach that um <clears throat> so it depends on the story for revision. Um, like some stories need more revision than others. Um, you helped me work on a story here that I actually rewrote it to start where the story had ended in the version you saw. Um, so that one needed more revision. I think for this collection, um, I worked on them a lot on my own for a while. Um, and then I had my friend Alex, who's here tonight, he read almost all of them and he would um mark them up and we would discuss them um so that was really helpful to me um and I did big revisions or small revisions based on that um and I had a couple other friends I think Rebecca's here too read a couple stories too um and then uh I would have I had a, a Russian immigrant read the Pavel story um and my brother's girlfriend who's Mexican she read a couple stories too um just to make sure I had some details correct so that was kind of like my pro my overall process and then it came to wv press and i did i did um more revision so that that's how this collection came to be but every project is different so well, yeah. what's, what's your favorite part of the process do you like coming um, up with the stories or revising <laughs> them like is that do you have a preference or is it or i think just... i think that i like i used to always like you know writing the stories and I think now I like revising them more because um, you can really perfect them and go deeper. Um, so I think I, I do like revising best now. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> I think I'm the same. I think I struggle yeah. more. It's like it's it's kind of fun when you're starting from scratch, but it's also very difficult. Yeah. Uh, but then once you have a draft and you're revising it, you, you kind of have a little bit of uh, a grasp of what the story is about and then it's it's more fun to just actually try to tell it yeah. in, in the right way and to kind of dig more deeply into it so I I, prefer, I like revision more yeah. I'm, I'm always like <laughs> I'm breathing a sigh of relief once I have a full <laughs> and like, okay now I can actually start working on this right <laughs> to something uh, you know presentable yeah. my first drafts are horrible I'll be honest with you. like not 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 presentable at all um, okay, I'll, I'll ask you one more question, but we're, um, I, I want to leave some time for questions. So uh, while maybe we're, we're discussing this final question, if anyone has uh, questions that they want to uh, ask Rachel and you want to type them in the chat, or if we're going to like uh, have people talk, whichever way you want to, uh, to address that. But if you can start thinking about questions for her, if you have them, that would be wonderful. And my, my kind of uh, last question for now is if you, I know it's your 
for you you're celebrating the release and you have the right to celebrate for the next few months and not worry about what you're doing next but i'm curious about what you're doing next. so if you don't mind sharing uh, um are you working on something new or do you plan to work on something new and you know just a very very broad general idea about what it's going yeah. to be you think yeah um thanks for asking yeah i'm always working on something i just like to write a lot so <laughs> um but this specific thing is uh i wrote a short story when i was at wvu it was like 12 years ago um about a traveling women's basketball team in the 1930s i found that this actually happened there was a traveling women's basketball team during the great depression and they would go around to small towns and they would play men's teams so i wrote a short story based on that um but there are a few main characters and i just am trying to like expand it into a, sh a short novel right now um and yeah so I've, I've been with this coming out i've been going very very slowly on it but i am like delving into that and um it's nice i already had the idea um so and it's fun because like i've lived in different places in the u.s and um so they're just traveling to different places in the u.s and play <laughs> basketball and so it's like it's been um a f more fun project than some so yeah <laughs> that's what that sounds fascinating that's yeah. that's so interesting I'll, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll be keeping an eye out for that okay thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you well michael do we want to start taking questions or yeah absolutely continue as Rajya said, you can type them into the, the chat there or just pop on screen if you like, whatever you're most comfortable with. Yeah. Don't be shy. Anyone? Anyone? If not, I can continue asking questions. <laughs> yeah, you said you had a lot. So. <laughs> they seem to like your questions. <laughs> Well, go ahead, Raja. Okay. Um, <laughs> so when I reread this, I was taking notes about the <laughs> stories. <clears throat> and um, there are a couple of stories that, that I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about. Um, the, the first is Visitation Day, because Elena is such a compelling character, and I don't want to um, kind of like spoil it too much, um, or I don't know, like, if, you know, whichever, uh, much uh, uh, you're you're comfortable with me spoiling it, but it's it, there are multiple stories about motherhood, right? So we we and Elena's is is uh, very um, uh, touching in a way, but it's also very delicately done. And um, uh, do do you mind if I kind of like give us? Yeah, you can talk about it. Yeah, okay. Be because she's she 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 tried to commit suicide while she was pregnant, so her baby was taken from her after that, and um, the, the father has custody of the baby and then she has the visitation, right? So she, she gets to kind of like see the baby a month after she was born. And she's such a, a, an interesting character because you write her with such uh, compassion that there's never a sense of uh, judgment. It's, it's never, how could you do this, you know, or anything like that? And how could you do this when you're pregnant? So, um, so from, a, from just a, a character point of view and a psychology point of view to me, um, I thought it was fascinating. So, and on the other hand, we have other characters who have similar relationships with, with motherhood um, as well, such as uh, when um, uh, Matt's baby, that like Catherine, she get, that she gets to babysit the, the, the baby that's not hers. And then we get this also tender relationship that develops and then ends abruptly. So do you want to talk a little bit about how you develop these stories or specifically about Elena's character? Sure. Is there inspiration behind this or in like, yeah. And, and how do you manage to write such difficult characters in a way that that um, while well, you reserve judgment and you don't invite judgment from your reader either? Um, yeah, I could talk a little bit about Elena. Um, I sent it to a friend that story, a friend of mine who I I lived in in Russia with, and she said, you know, you're you're writing your Dostoevsky characters. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, I I used to read him when I was uh, like in high school. I haven't read him for years and years, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I guess like yeah. just the complexity and stuff. She uh, she felt like it was it was like that. Um, 
So that one, I when I moved back to Oregon, I worked at a library here and we would have people come in on visitations, like to visit their kids. And none of them I knew very well. Like I only saw them a couple times. Um, but just the idea that that was a thing, I didn't know that. Um, so that that came from that. Um, I learned in when I was in Colorado um, that, uh, which I mentioned in there, that like in Colorado, if you're next of kin to someone and they're very sick, you can like force them into treatment, which you can't do in Oregon, um, which is interesting thing to me. Um, I think I, I've had like close friends and things with like mental health issues. Um, so it's something that I've observed, um, I guess, and that I didn't take exactly from their situations, but I just know how complicated it is. And I wouldn't like judge someone for, for having issues um, like mental health issues, no matter what situation they were in, I guess. So um, that's, that's kind of where that came from. The, the whole like having a baby during that time. I mean, the character, just like I said, it just came to me like fully formed. And then I kind of grab where that's from. I really appreciated how um, you mentioned wanting to hear more about Elena. And one thing that I did after Rogia's critique was write a story called At the Lake, which is about a librarian who has her own story, but um, she sees Elena coming into the library. And so we get to learn a little bit more um, about Elena. And I think that it's her life is his heading in a hopeful direction, I think, that you that you understand from that. Another thing in Elena's story that, which was ni nice about living in like 14 different places, I have a lot of um, <laughs> different uh, places to choose from, like to set things. So where Elena lived, she lived like on top of a garage and her landlords lived in a house. Um, and I lived in a place like that for about four months. Um, so her landlords, um, or trying to like support her and be friends with her. And um, I think when I lived away, I had like several couples in my life that they were kind to me in that way. So I think that that came from from that aspect. Um, so moved a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I, I loved a couple of things about, about your answer about the character. First, I think I, I loved seeing Elena again. And this is something that you do so well throughout the collection is just bringing those characters back but bring them, bringing them back in a meaningful and extremely satisfying way. It's always this like beautiful surprise because the reader, like you live with the, with the character for the duration of the short story and you learn so much about them from their point of view. So it's a very intimate relationship. And then you kind of lose track of them for a while. So whenever they pop back uh, kind of in another story, it's so satisfying and Elena's return was perfect. Okay. And I love her because you can actually see and like a character arc developing there. So it's not just, oh, this is the same story, you know, here you, here you are, you can see her again. It's almost like there's a whole other story that happened between the time we last saw her and the time we meet her again. And you manage to kind of encompass all of that in, in, the, in, in whatever short span that you have with her in the new story. So, um, so that was perfect. And <laughs> the way you portray her as is, is I think is a very, good example of just the compassion you have for all your characters and it shows through it's just it's very it's it's a very compassionate way of telling their story and we have questions yeah so, uh, yeah so michael do you want to take sure. that over? yeah john asks uh what is the origin of friendship story um yeah so that story i started that story because I kind of, I wanted to write about the town um, and something, I wanted to talk about the history of the town through the eyes of one of the people. Um, and originally I was gonna trace the man's relationship with his town his whole life. And you can kind of sense that, but it actually turned into a friendship story and it traces two men's relationship in the town. Um, I think it came from just like me, learning about the history of some of the towns in Boulder County. And also there's a town right outside Portland called Oregon City where I worked in the library. It's actually where my mom grew up. Um, and it was a industrial town, like a lot of those towns in Boulder City. And, and now it's, it's kind of become gentrified a little bit. Um, and so 
it, it was just tracing and it has a similar story in some ways to these towns. Um, so was, I had a little bit more of a personal connection there as well as living in the towns. And so I wanted um, to show this one man's life who had been involved in kind of like the industry of the town and then what happens to him like as as he gets older at least this one person so yeah also has an amazing ending because it doesn't end where you think it should end it ends yeah up here. and i don't want to spoil that but that was i read that i was like ooh, that's that's a nice nice trick <laughs> not trick but you know it's it's just a, yeah. a nice way to approach the ending of the story yeah thank you <laughs> that was a good one uh, Nicolette, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Are you going on tour, Rachel? <laughs> Will we be able to see you in person? Yes. So um, I'm going on tour next week. I will be in West Virginia, which is kind of close to Nicole. <laughs> uh, next um, Monday night, I will be reading with some other women who graduated from there. Um, uh, so, and then I'll be reading in Baltimore at a bookstore I worked at on Tuesday politics at prose on Wednesday and in Raleigh with a friend on Thursday. So I'm going on tour. I'm excited. <laughs> That's exciting. That's back to back. That's like, I know. <laughs> well, I wanted to make it worthwhile, you know? Um, so I, I'm excited because I'm, I'm using it to, to see old friends as well and go That's back good. to places I lived. So. And speaking of old friends, I think just a shout out to Sarah Monroe. I think he, she's here. Today. Yes. Yeah. Rachel's yeah. Editor. WB, yes so. yeah thank you sarah yes <laughs> she's been great um so she saw the collection two years ago worked and worked with me on it uh revising it as well so yeah thank you so. all right do you have any other one last question Congratulations, Sarah. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations are also good. Yes. yes. Nice <laughs> thank you, everyone, yeah, for coming. And Rajia, thank you so much for your questions and your enthusiasm and your dialogue. It's meant a lot. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for, for <laughs> inviting me to celebrate with you and congratulations. It's a beautiful yeah. collection. Thank you. It's a really interesting read, and I've read it, you know, multiple times. <laughs> It's it's just as much fun the second and third time around as it was the first time. So, uh, yeah, I hope I hope everyone here. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you all uh, <laughs> grab a copy of Rachel's beautiful collection and enjoy it as much as I did. And thank you, Michael, for hosting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, it was great. I'll uh, put the link here in the chat one last time to give you an opportunity to hop over there to. Any blooms, we'd really appreciate it if you bought the, the book from us. Rachel's available to come in and sign and personalize copies if you put a little comment in the chat or in the comment section about that. And we'll get those shipped out to folks. Um, yes, thank you again, both of you. It was a really wonderful conversation. And thanks to everyone attending tonight. It's been recorded, so it'll be up on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Yes, yeah, have a good night. Bye. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.